Um, I've been in Four Coins about six years, and uh, I've been a developer for about 15. And I could, I think you could say the first half of it was all server side struts and the original kind of spring framework. And we used to utter things like in Rod we trust and talking about Rod Johnson and things like that. And then um, when I came over to the US, there was a little stint in the Air Force for a while. Then I uh, continued on as a developer and I've done a lot more front end stuff in the second half of my career than I did in the first half. And that's really ramped up at Data Splice because uh, the product we have um, has some particularly complex challenges for the front end. A lot of what we do has to work offline. Uh, a lot of multiple devices, uh, really kind of pushing the boundaries of what you can do um, within the HTML5 spec offline. So um, I've learned a lot being there. And uh, I kind of struggled with how to frame this whole thing because there's so many different things you could talk about. And I envisage the usual kind of crowd that we have. And um, what I want to do is, uh, is, is kind of paint a picture of the journey that maybe has been happening in um, front end development um, over the last number of years uh, and, and maybe uh, highlight some, some of the ideas upon which there's been some convergence across different frameworks and talk about some of the reasons of why there might have been some convergence like that. Um, so yeah, um, here's most of the slides are not that color, so that's good. <laughs> so here's a quick overview of, uh, of what we're doing. Uh, we're going to have a background where I'm going to lead into uh, the intro to Elm, talk a little bit about why Elm's different, because there are a number of, not necessarily competing, but there's a number of choices for uh, programming languages to use on the front end today. And some of them have a, quite a close relationship with JavaScript. They, uh, and some of them have, Although they'll compile to JavaScript, they're, they're vastly different uh, animals. So we'll, we'll talk about how Elm relates to some of those and what might be unique about it in relative to things like PureScript or, um, or, or ClojureScript, things like that. We'll talk about Elm's type system a little bit. And towards the end, you can see where I just ran out of time. And there's a whole list of things I wish I had time to talk about. And maybe we can have a conversation about that stuff. But um, these things take a lot more time than you realize when you only do them like once a year. So. Um, so uh, the programs that we write uh, in general consist of a combination of, of state and behavior. Um, and the state is all the information pertaining to your program at a given point in time. And then the behavior are the rules that you've implemented about how that state is displayed um, and changed over time, uh, the logic, and then also changes that you make to external state. Um, so that, that's really what our, what our programs are, are composed of. Posed of. And when you interact with a web app over time, uh, you're checking boxes, typing in text, clicking things, dragging things, new data is appearing, old data is disappearing. And after a time of playing around with a web app, it looks very different from when you first started interacting with it. So, where do developers track all of these changes? Well, the traditional answer, unfortunately, is, is kind of all over the place. Um, when we're working on these projects, we're supposed to be building uh, applications for customers, not necessarily building tools. So we use the tools that are available to us at a given point in time. Uh, early on, there weren't really very much more tools beyond just JavaScript and the DOM. Um, you didn't have the kind of giant plethora of frameworks and competing ideas and really kind of rich ecosystem that, you can, you, that everyone knows exists today for the JavaScript uh, platform. And so uh, it was pretty common for you to store state, um, the state part of your application, in the DOM. You know, you get a page served down by the server, and then now you've got some state in the DOM. And then your job, if you're working with a front end, is to kind of read state out of that DOM and maybe write some state back to that DOM, replace them in a text of elements. And you're actually, early, early on, you're working quite manually with the DOM API. And um, that's because the, the tools to do anything much further than that didn't really exist. So there's lots, there's lots of DOM work. And so inevitably, um, we start to invent tools, tools that help us do the kind of work that we were doing at the time, which is manipulating and interacting with the DOM. So uh, probably 
I know everyone's familiar with jQuery, but there's probably a long list of old tools that have, you know, since ceased to have activity on them over time. And so um, I don't know how long everyone's been doing web applications, but um, a long time ago they were really, really way more messy than they are today. And um, uh, I think we've all been there where there's a production project and maybe you're not working on it anymore, that you're on the next project and that one's you're supposed to have been able to put it behind you. But there's, uh, there's a production project and someone notices an inconsistency. And of course you're busy and you've got multiple projects and deadlines coming up, but this thing's on you because you touched it once. So now you know about it and you have to work on it. So despite what you already have on your plate, you have to go ahead and spend perhaps a not insignificant time, amount of time trying to track down or reproduce this problem, track down the cause of it, which could be a very circuitous route because we didn't have a lot of structure in early uh, web applications which hadn't con you know, congealed into some, some more order. Um, and eventually uh, you've got to fix it. So you, you take this time out of your schedule and eventually you think you've found the cause of the problem. And so you apply the fix and lo and behold, it's still broken. And you're starting to get a bit stressed now because you're running out of time. You weren't even supposed to be working on this today. And you got to, now you're facing the question of how come that didn't fix it? And you're scratching your head and maybe I've got, I've got state in two different places or maybe there's more than one thing that can change this and I was only tinkering with one of them and the other one's still pulling the rug out from under my feet. Or maybe you actually did fix it, but uh, to your horror, you know, you broke something else and now you started a great big fun game of whack-a-mole with this early kind of really complex project that I'm so happy that I'm not working on anymore, although we've got our other problems now, but anyway. So um, in, these, in these early days, you had it was quite common that you had um, data changed from multiple different places in your application. Event handlers tied to DOM nodes that might be competing with each other and it's really hard to predict the order in which they're running. And uh, perhaps you're working on a team and multiple people have messed around with this code base and uh, they've got a huge fear of, uh, of breaking existing code. So they're not exactly kind of refactoring. They're just you know, trying to apply these quick fixes. So finally, you get through it and you fix it. Um, but you notice this other thing, which maybe no one else has noticed yet, this weird edge case or behavior. And you're, you're going, hmm, I don't really have time to do that. You know, I was, I was only supposed to fix that bug, not go back and like refactor this old project. I've, I've already got this maybe one or two other projects I'm supposed to be working on. So you, you, you can't just leave it though, so you just wearily add another if else inside some function somewhere and just move on. Like, and, you know, and that, that is how monsters are created. And, and I know we've all been there at some point or another. So um, yeah, it used, I mean, one of the reasons I was a back-end developer in my early days is because I didn't want to live in this world. You know, I was, I was preaching the, uh, Ron, Rod Johnson's you know, spring style MVC stuff and we'd been using struts and then we moved on to the spring framework and we're all getting on with dependency injection and AOP and we've got, we've got design patterns and we're looking at these front end guys and going, no thanks, you know. Um, but eventually things start, did start to become nicer and a few concepts start uh, creeping into the front end world. Um, we start coming up with the idea of, of models and maybe we have some two-way data binding with those models to the DOM and we've got templates that we can you know, put variables in and the models just kind of snap into your template. We've got event buses, things like that. Um, but it seems like recently though, we've gone one step further and there's some convergence on some, uh, some different ideas. So imagine um, that you move into a, a beautiful, nice, fully furnished apartment um, and you notice that uh, the picture on the wall is wonky. And you think, I'll just burn the apartment to the ground <laughs> and I'll move into the nice new one next door. Um, that might seem like a bit of overkill. It's, it's kind of wasteful, but it's easy to understand though. You know, when, when you want to change, you just scrap the previous apartment, create a new, almost identical one with a straight picture on the wall finally. And, um, you know, you, you get on with your life. Um, and what we're seeing with, with uh, some of the newer frameworks today, and there, there's multiple, is this idea of um, doing that same thing with the DOM. Uh, so we're talking about frameworks like React or Cycle or Vue, and uh, maybe they share an implementation of the 
by the way, all the images have got these horrible borders around them, and I didn't have time to worry about it. This whole presentation is a single markdown file. Um, so yeah, they might use the same implementation of the virtual DOM, or maybe React's got their own, but these other two are using a third-party virtual DOM. And the idea with the virtual DOM is that you've got your data, and you pass it into a function, and it spits out some DOM. And uh, you can think of that in isolation. You know, you can, I've got my big complex web app, but for this one little widget here, I'm going to have my React component, or whatever it might be, and I'm going to give it some data, and it's going to reliably spit out some DOM, and I can understand what's going on. And this is, this is nice. Um, I can initialize my component with some properties. It can manage its own state. It's not being touched by the outside world. And I can even nest them inside each other, them inside each other. And so you start, you know, your, your little React component idea spreads. And in the end, your whole entire application is built out of these nested boxes that have their own state and manage them together. Um, but the reality behind uh, these little components, they don't, they don't you know, take in some data and then return some DOM. Uh, they return a description of the DOM um, uh, as, as data. And so something else consumes that description and performs the side effect of actually messing with the DOM and doing the changes. Um, and that's the virtual DOM library. You know, React implements its own, and then I know that uh, Cycle uses a separate virtual DOM library, and the way that it's structured is it, it can switch that out for another one. So you know, the idea of having a DOM manager is, is a separate and kind of uh, isolated idea that another framework can bring in to add to its host of other capabilities. So in that way, where the virtual DOM gets given these instructions, the description of the, of the, the, the DOM, uh, and then it performs the work of doing the side effect. In that way, the virtual DOM is actually an effect manager. And the side effect it's having uh, on the world is just one kind of side effect. There. It's having the side effect of when you, give it a, when you give it a description of the work it should do, the work it does is to go and change the state of the DOM. And um, that's a really nice idea because um, when you delegate the task of performing the actual side effects, the dirty work, to someone else, then um, that, that actor that's doing the dirty work can perform some work on your behalf. They can start to maybe queue and batch these requests to manipulate the DOM um, and that, that might result in fewer you know, mutations of the DOM over time, uh, but end up with exactly the same result had it done the less efficient multiple writes of the DOM. So it can minimize DOM mutation. One of the other nice things it can do, and I think almost all of the virtual DOM implementations do this, is you describe the, the DOM and give it as input. And it says, I like what you're doing, but I'm going to give this slightly different but guaranteed to be cross-platform compliant version of the DOM instead. And so now you've kind of offloaded that task. You can describe a DOM, and it will actually produce maybe a similar DOM, but one that is more cross-platform capable than the one you instructed it to create. So in a way, you can kind of almost start to forget about it when you're building your application out of these components because you're thinking in terms of data coming in and just describing the new version of the apartment that that, that, that guy should create. So it's just data in um, and DOM out as far as you're concerned. Your mental model is greatly simplified. Instead of trying to remember and manage all of these different things that all might be changing the DOM all at the same time, you manage individual discrete units. And you can think in that universe, and, and your mental load is, is the size of that component at one time, the data in the data out. And so um, you know, uh, each component uh, can have its own state. So if I'm fiddling with my widget down here, which is part of a bigger widget, the changes going on here, the, the guys around me don't necessarily know about it. And that, in, in some sense, is a, is a strength. But in, in other senses, that's also a bit of a disadvantage, because just like when we were manually interacting with the DOM and throwing bits of state as attributes, data attributes everywhere, just like we were doing then, our state, when each of the components owns its own state, is still kind of spread out. Um, and maybe you know you want a piece of state to appear in two places, or you want some condition to be based on a piece of state in more than one place. So two different things need to know about it. And now you have the task of keeping those two things in sync, and of course, inevitably, bugs that revolve around them being out of sync start to emerge because it's tough, it's complicated. So um, that's, of course, not an uncommon problem. And uh, 
the idea of centralizing the state instead and then passing it just down the tree of components rather than having them each own their state is an idea that, uh, that came about. Um, in that way, uh, you have a, a single source of truth for your, for your state. And the tree of UI elements is simply the output of a function that takes that source of truth and decides how to, how to render it. And of course, remember, it's producing the description of the DOM and a separate actor, the virtual DOM, is, is taking that, that as instructions and doing the dirty work in a more efficient cross-platform way. You delegated that off. So, uh, of course, if your components are now just getting this state coming down the tree, they need some way that they can ask for changes to that state to happen. Um, so the, uh, early on in, in React applications, uh, there was a lot of discussion. And I'm talking about React, by the way, because I've got more experience with React than some of the other frameworks. I've not really got much direct experience with Angular, but I, I know about some of the ways in which it differs. Um, same goes for Cycle and Vue. Vue and React are much more similar to each other than the other ones are. Um, so yeah, we need these components need to be able to ask for changes to the state. And early on, you would see that they are passing callbacks up the tree to say, um, I would like for you to change my uh, state by calling this function. And so now the parent has knowledge about the state and it can distribute it down. And so that was that was like an early mechanism, but it's kind of cumbersome because if, you're, if your components are deeply nested, then each each guy in between has got to kind of take the bucket and pass it up the tree and then pass it back down. And you end up with a lot of boilerplate where half of the props in any, you know, in any component halfway down the tree are things that it's, it only has so it can give them to other people. Maybe only, you know, the other half of the ones it compares about. So there's, you know, there's these kind of inefficiencies that irk programmers who like things to be normalized and, you know, uh, elegant. So the idea of um, dispatching some messages out to the world uh, as a way of asking for cha changes to state emerged. And so the, uh, the owner of that centralized state is someone who's now listening to those messages from all the various depths of the trees. And they say, hey, I've just got a, a message coming for performing some, some action. I'd like to go and update the database and then you know, uh, update my single state tree with the results of that, and then everyone gets it. And so we've got this single idea of throwing out a message, which everyone does it the same way. And the result of someone throwing out a message is if there's some changes to the state to be made, it comes from the top down and everyone benefits from it. So you don't have this kind of duplication problem anymore because the state just comes in this unidirectional top down way. And everyone's using the same mechanism to ask for mutations to that state to happen. So your mental, talking, go ahead. Like subscriber model? Not quite because with that, you can have multiple people subscribing and publishing, and they might do things in response to that, and you, you might quickly, you know, that, that's, that's less of a kind of top-down unidirectional data flow model, and that's more of a multi-directional data flow model. Um, this is more of a, at any level in the tree, someone can send out a message, but there's only one listener to the message, and that listener maybe does something, sends out an HTTP request or selects something for from the database, and maybe after having done whatever work it was doing, it decides the state should look like this now. And then and only then, it gives that one single new version of it, and it trickles down the tree. So that's that's how that would differ. Um, so yeah, uh, and it passes it down. And, and this is um, what frameworks like Redux uh, came about to do. So originally, we had this nice idea of self-contained encapsulated components but then we realize they all kind of need to know about the same stuff and it's cumbersome. So let's centralize the state. But now we need something to have the job of managing, making changes to it. So what Redux is, is a, is a centralized state manager. So that, that idea is not bound to React in any particular way. You can use Redux in an Angular application to manage a single state tree that is then fed to all your Angular components. Um, but this idea emerged, though, because it's cumbersome. It's, it's less cumbersome to do this than it is to try to manage state that exists in multiple places. So uh, any questions so far on that, or you good to carry on? So um, when you have, though, uh, a single state object, um, and 
most of us here have done JavaScript, so we know the difference between a reference type and a primitive type. With a reference type in JavaScript, I can make changes to it. Another variable with a reference to the same object can also make changes to it. You can't do that with primitives, you have your own copy. So if, you, if all your state is in this object that's a reference type, and all of these different places in your application have a reference to that object, then in theory, and inevitably at some point, two people are going to be mutating this object when they shouldn't be. The way they're supposed to mutate that object is by being good citizens of our state tree and sending out a message and asking the other guy to do that job, and then I just get the new hallowed state you know, from, from up on high. So we've got this problem that anyone can have a, a reference to this single object and, of course, mutate it. Does that make sense to everyone about having a reference to the object? Okay. I didn't know what kind of crowd we've got, and they're way more advanced, which is cool. So, um, so yeah. Um, the next idea becomes, well, that's easy. We just use some kind of library to make this single version of the state immutable. Um, and JavaScript doesn't have immutability baked into it at all. If you want something that is modeling immutability in JavaScript, you have to use a library. And using a library uh, has a price because now your interaction with objects is not the kind of seamless native one that you had, although seamless immutable looks like a pretty cool option if you like that. Yeah, yeah, so um, you've got to kind of move your data structures into and out of the immutable version of that data structure. And, you know, when, it, when it's out of it, it's now, it's now kind of out of the tank and it can, it's under fire. You know, once you put it back in the box, it's safe again, but it's just another opportunity for things to go wrong when you pull it out. Plus, it's, you've now got code in your code base that's doing this work of taking it out and putting it back in that didn't used to even exist. But you know, so you've got to ask, you've got to ask yourself if that's worth the price, you know, for the for whatever kind of benefits I might get from now that the, my single state tree is immutable. So you've implemented all these ideas, um, and you're taking a look back, and, and your application seems a lot simpler to understand, and you're you're looking good so far. Um, but then, you're you you live on for you know for a few weeks, and uh, somewhere else in the code base, some other guy refactors how they model um, inventory. So we used to have inventory, which is a part of our state tree, um, as just an array of objects. And that array of objects was part of the state tree that was being given to all the guys below. But someone else, for some other reason that you weren't necessarily aware of, or you know you missed on, on the, the, the code review, changed that to be an object, and now items is just a property of that object. Um, and You've got somewhere in one of your components, you've got this code where you're asking if props.inventory, so inventory is given to this component, dot length, then I iterate over it, and this is, I don't know if the pseudo code's right, then you know, display an inventory item component for each guy in the list. Otherwise, there are none. But of course, inventory is not an array anymore. It, 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 you can say dot length, and you're going to, because it's an object, unless it happens to have a length property, which it likely won't. It's going to return undefined, and this pro this little component here, uh, which might only be conditionally shown sometimes, you know, when someone's actually using the app, it's not it's uh, it's never showing inventory. It thinks there's none when there actually are some on the object. So if someone calls up and says, "Hey, the inventory in this widget that's kind of a dark corner of our application never shows up," um, and you're thinking, "Well," and you're going to look at the start of the code where it fetches inventory, and you're like, "No, it's definitely getting the inventory. I can see it in the state tree." What he's showing, what he's talking about, and you spend time kind of tracking this down, and eventually you realize, and you're even looking at this, and there's no error thrown whatsoever. You have no warning on the console. There's no errors anywhere in the application. It just is wrong. This part changed. This part didn't. They totally don't make sense, but no one knows anything about it. And JavaScript, being JavaScript, just says, "Yeah, undefined is falsy. I'm going to move on." Um, so. Of course, that's not an uncommon thing. So yet again, the community starts to find ways of solving that problem. And someone on our team that got burned by this starts moving around, and they notice something they hadn't seen in the React documentation. And they've got this idea of prop types. See, I, the idea of prop types is that uh, for each of those components in your tree, you can say this component expects to get these properties to configure it. That's the data in. And it uses those properties to decide what data out to render. Um, and what you can do is you can mark each of the properties as being a certain type of object. You can say this 
So this is what it might look like. You'll have other things in there. You'll have your prop types, and you'll say, I've got a prop called inventory, and it's type is object, and it's required. Uh, if it wasn't required, and I gave it an array, I get an error on my console. If it wasn't required, if it is required, but I give it null or undefined, I'm going to get an error on my console. So you realize that had you put this in the, uh, the component earlier, someone would have known much earlier on that the refactoring of the way inventory is modeled broke something because you start seeing this warning on the console that never used to exist. So you're thinking, this is a good idea. I'm going to go through all my components, and I'm going to put prop types everywhere. And then lo and behold, you start seeing these warnings popping up that you didn't know about because they were just silently failing. And this is great because what you have here is, is a to-do list. And to-do lists are really, really awesome because you can, you can stop working on them, go and think about something else completely, even come back Monday. When you come back, your to-do list is right where it is. These things are checked. These ones aren't. I can be productive like immediately when I arrive at work now because I've got this to-do list. Um, so you happily go through and fix all the warnings. And now you know that because you're not seeing any warnings, at least at this moment in time, all of my components in this hierarchy are getting given the right data type. If they, if it's required, they're getting, they're getting given it. I'm losing my tongue here. I think it's beer time. <laughs> you know, you're feeling pretty good about things relative to earlier. You've uncovered some stuff. <coughs> so there's been a journey, and like I said, there's been some convergence. You know, a lot of these frameworks share some of these ideas. They're of course not all the same, but um, it's becoming more common. Uh, in newer frameworks that there will be some implementation of a virtual DOM rather than not. There's a lot of other benefits that we can probably dig into later. Um, your spread, you know, state that used to be spread out is generally kind of becoming agreed upon that it might be a better idea for certain reasons to centralize that state. We could probably all agree that unidirectional data flow is way easier to track and reason about than multidirectional data flow. Um, when things are immutable, you can kind of rule out whole classes of causes of problems. Um, and instead of maybe silently having these, not even type errors, I shouldn't have put that, this should just be silently type wrongness. <laughs> then you have, now you've got type checking in these UI props. And, and these are now, what though, though you learned these from having used a framework, even if you're not using that framework anymore, these are ideas that you've got lodged away and these are tools on your belt that you know, when you're doing something with another technology stack, you'll be thinking, where's the equivalent of that? Because I know how it helped me eliminate a certain class of problem that um, can, you know, to, to bite us. So, so that's my background uh, section. Um, so the intro to Elm is going to start by talking and playing with Babel. So now I've got to uh, mirror my written display. Um, let's go to, can everyone see that okay? What's the resolution like? Terrible? Hmm. Resolution's very high. <laughs> yeah, I want, I want it to be much better. Uh, that's not what I want, is it? Yeah, try 720. 720, that is what I want. Choose the milk white. No, hang on. There we go. That's that's probably acceptable, right? Okay. So, um, right. Um, some of you guys have used Redux before, and a bunch of you have used used Angular. So, no one's lost right now, right? Cool. So, um, who hasn't heard? Oh, they remembered my stuff. Cool. Who hasn't heard of um, Babel? Sure. All right. Does anyone actually not know what it is? <laughs> so that, that one I don't really know about. It is not anything like JS Fiddle. What we're looking at on the screen right now can maybe you can see that it would be similar to JS Fiddle. So Babel is a um, so JavaScript has iterations, and there's a there's a committee that argues about what should be in the next version of the language. And when they think of something really cool, there's a lag, and browser vendors and, and you know the Node team and whoever else hasn't necessarily implemented that cool new feature, but everyone wants it now. So what Babel is, 
is it says, I will give you that cool new feature. Uh, but if you write code in that way, you just filter it through me, and I spit out the horrible like earlier version of JavaScript that will work everywhere. So that's what Babel does. So you start, you know, you can start using things like arrow functions and stuff like that. I'm actually going to delete this. So um, you saw this pluralize function. Um, function pluralize. I'm going to have a singular. Some of this might be familiar to people who have seen Richard Feldman's talk, and I'm totally stealing parts of this from other people, but I'm linking to them at the end, so it's cool. Um, <laughs> plural and then quantity. So this guy is um, if uh, quantity is triple equals to one. Well, we won't even talk about double equals. I know you know what that is. Um, then we return singular, else we're going to return plural. Cool. So now down here I can say console.log uh, pluralize, and the singular is going to be geese, oh no, goose, sorry. And the plural is going to be geese, and then if I give it the number one, it's going to say goose, and if I give it three, it says geese. Awesome, right? <laughs> so on the right hand side though, the code is, apart from the use strict, the code is identical. So if we come here and we say var pluralize equals, and then we put a little arrow function in here, which is one of the ES6, or I can never remember, it might be ES5. Anyway, it's a new feature that people wanted. Um, now, what's on the left and what's on the right are different from each other. Um, can I see my speaker notes? Yeah, so now, now they're different from each other. And this is because um, the Babel is, is converting your JavaScript that might not work in all the target environments that are out there into a JavaScript that does the same thing, but it will work in all of the target environments that you care about. So this is cool. Um, so um, so that's, that's Babel. You've got some, some code goes in on the left-hand side, and then you've got a processor that turns that code into JavaScript that works nicely everywhere. That's, a, that's the concept here. So we might, uh, we might consider the same thing uh, in Elm. So this is a, a kind of, what do you guys prefer? I don't know, what, I'll just have the, I'll have the lights on. Lights better. Lights better, yeah. So um, you can ignore just for the time being the code that's already there. Um, we're not gonna do a console log, we'll just print some text inside that main function. So here's one statement. Every single Elm program always has a main function that's the entry point. Not uncommon. Java, same thing. So uh, I'm going to do my pluralized function, but in Elm now. So we're going to have singular plural quantity equals. If uh, quantity double equals one, there is no triple equals, um, then singular. Else, uh, plural, and then down here instead of hello world, I'm gonna have pluralize, pluralize, uh, goose, geese, one. So if I compile this, this should say goose, right? Ah, there's a then keyword in Elm. So if I compile this, it should say goose. And if I switch to three, we're going to get geese. Cool. So, let's see. Some obvious differences. You know, we've got this pluralized function. No function keyword, no arrow, no var, no parens, no commas. The first word here is the name of your function. All the rest of the words are the names of the arguments for that function. Then an equal sign and then the body of the function. Uh, you're also going to notice we've got no parens around this part. Um, we've got a then keyword. Uh, there's no return. Um, and the, the reason why there's no return is that uh, in Elm, everything is an expression. So this entire section of code right here is a single expression. Uh, it's a value, essentially. Um, based on quantity. 
So um, if quantity is one, then the expression evaluates to singular. And if it's not, then it evaluates to plural. So uh, what we're doing up here is we're just importing a, an HTML library, which, which is uh, exposing a text function. Text is a function. The argument for it is a string. Pluralize returns a string. I know we haven't said that it returns a string. Go ahead. If you have a uh, second if under that first if, how do you know which else goes with it? So another if, so let's say I, I want one here. So before before that. So under underneath singular. Underneath singular? Yeah. So another if here? Yeah. So I might have if true, then and then only one statement. Banana. But no else. Ah, well, that's a really good question, but no so else. Which else, which else does, it, does, does that else, which if does that else belong to? This is a great question. So if this code runs, we're going to, and I'm giving it one, just to make that part run, it's going to say, right, quantity is one, cool. Singular, all right, whatever. If true, then banana. And then if, if, L, if, if false, which it won't be, maybe I should say uh, one greater than two. Uh, let's do the other way around. Two greater than one. So it's going to evaluate that and then banana. And let's see what happens. You get an error. So you can't have an if without an else because it needs to evaluate to a single value because it's an expression. In JavaScript, if you have an if and there's no else, you just get undefined. Yeah, it just makes its own else. Oh, else undefined. That's not a thing in Elm. So, so you, you can so try to write code like that, but you'll never be able to put it into production because it won't even compile. Right. So, well, I guess my point is that there's there's a cost for not having curly braces, parentheses, etc. Et, et there is a cost here. So the beauty of this is you guys get to argue about that, <laughs> and I can ignore it. I, I look forward to observing the debate about that. But my point is that it doesn't always come from the 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 last the 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 lack of syntax syntax or you know commas and such like that. Comes at a price. So I can put. Uh, white, I, white space is well, but that's that's that that's. That's that. I mean, that's a point. I don't need to do um, that. But, then, but cool. that's an implied. There's movement. a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Yeah. So what happens? What's actually happening when you press compile? So yeah, good question. Sorry. So um, in the Babel example, I didn't do anything, and it just happens to be listening and automatically just. Translating things. They could have a compile button here in the Babel example, and what would happen is it would take the text from the left as input, run it through the Babel transpiler, and then generate some code. So, but I, there's no button because it does it automatically. So over here, what's happening when I press compile is it's taking this text as input and it's passing it to the Elm compiler, and the Elm compiler is analyzing the text and seeing can I make a valid JavaScript program out of that? If it can, it will run it. So yeah, Elm Elm compiles. It compiles it to JavaScript. It doesn't transpile it. And we'll talk about the differences. That's exactly the next thing we're going to go so to do. Is I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's open source, so you can look at the compiler. Um, they do have, like everyone, you know, WebAssembly aspirations. And actually, I saw something on Twitter today. I think it was today. That like the first draft spec of WebAssembly is finally being released, so people can start implementing a version of it. So that's pretty cool. I don't, we're not going to talk about WebAssembly tonight, but it's a compilation target, so you can write things in any language, and then browsers will just process WebAssembly instead of processing a language like JavaScript. Anyway, you can look. So you can all Google that. So Elm has plans to compile into WebAssembly. Aspirations. Aspirations. They're pragmatic. <laughs> there's things that it needs to do. It wants to do all of those things, but there's, you know, they have to be done in a certain order, and it might not be at the top of the list yet. Yeah. Cool. So, um, need my cheat sheet. Hold on a sec.
think it might be relevant to mention that elements uh, in version 17. When they say 17, they mean 0.17. Uh, so it is still very young. And I think the kind of aspirations is really important. Yeah, I, do, 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 do. this is the presentation, by the way. Um, you know what? I'm going to try and do it from memory. Um, so, oh, I, I think it's in the presentation. No, it's not. Cool. All right, so let's play with uh, these things some more. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to make a, a typo on the left-hand side. Instead of singular, I'm going to say singular. All right. And um, so I didn't have to press compile. It's already compiled it for me. I could, um, but now let's have a look at the output. We've got geese. Well, I'm passing in three, right? So let's pass in one. Singular is not defined. Okay, so I've got an error here, but I had to actually run this branch of the code in order for that error to emerge. Babel doesn't look at the whole in fact, Babel doesn't look at anything. It just takes your JavaScript and translates whatever it is you've typed into JavaScript. So it takes wrong JavaScript, and it's like, here's cross-platform wrong JavaScript. <laughs> that's what it's doing for you. you know. And the only way I know that that's a typo is because I've run the code. There's a runtime error. Because if I put three here, we just get geese, and it's all good. So this singular, what's that? Yeah, it's all good. It's geese. Like, we never, ever tested for the one. <laughs> so, yeah, but the thing is, that will get shipped, though. And then, like, only on the day that someone runs that one line of code, and this is ludicrously simple code, so it's very realistic that a line of your code might not get run for a while, this is going to go out into production. So uh, it's like a time bomb, and it's sitting there, and nothing warns you. Not even Babel warns you, which is supposed to be awesome and give you these great newfangled capabilities. Well, because it's transpiling. It's, exactly. it's not compiling. It's not compiling. Yeah. That's what we got. So uh, let's try to do the same thing in Elm. Uh, let's, let's compile the correct version first. And then we'll say, right. Oh, yeah, I'll make it three. Thanks, Matt. Wingman. So um, it's going to go through. And it's not one. So that's cool. It'll just jump to plural. Or. I didn't run the branch of code with the one in it, but I still have this error. Because, yeah, now, um, because what Elm's doing is it's looking at the entire program and all of the variables in it, and it's checking the whole thing for consistency. And if it finds some kind of problem anywhere in that program, and it's way more sophisticated than just this example here, then it's going to say, I would love to create a wrong program for you, but that's not how we roll in Elmland. <laughs> I'm getting carried away now. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> I had so much. So anyway, the point, <laughs> so the point is, you know, um, I cannot possibly deploy this because I have no JavaScript output. It won't even make the JavaScript. So it's impossible for me, even if I'm trying to sabotage this code with a typo, it's impossible for that to ever get to production because it won't manufacture the results in JavaScript file. So that's so interesting. You're saying the scope of singular is limited in Elm? Because in JavaScript, singular would be a global variable. No, singular is not a global variable. It's scoped to this function. That's, and that's a feature of Babel. No, that's just a JavaScript rule. So JavaScript has not block function. What's the name for the scope? Yeah, so anyway, it's the use strict. Use strict means that if you refer to something that's not defined, then it's not Okay. Right. So um, I'm going to go and like put things back. Geese. And I'll fix that. And we're back to uh, geese. All right, so that was um, that illustrated some a difference there between uh, Babel and Elm. So how about. I've got to really watch my time. So how about instead here if I, I'm going to say I'm going to give it a one, but it's going to be like a string one. And I think everyone knows if I gave this a double equals, JavaScript has this type coercion feature, which you probably never want to use because it's really going to come and bite you. 
So anyway, we'll ignore that, like I said. But I'm going to give it this one, and um, it's giving me geese, even though one is goose, right? One should be goose, because actually quantity is not the number one. Quantity is the string one, which is what the triple equals means. So it's just saying, that's false. Carry on. Return plural. Um, no error. This is obviously wrong. Um, but I'm not getting any kind of error. In fact, this could be one, and I get exactly the same outcome. I'm not getting an error whatsoever. At least, at least when I went through this branch of code with the typo, it gave me an error. Uh, it said, hey, singular, there's no argument in your function called singular. This time around, I go through the same branch of code, and I get no error whatsoever, even if I do something uh, crazy. So, um, that's really bad. That's kind of like what we talked about earlier with the, uh, the inventory items. The code's wrong. It's got this wrong behavior. But literally nothing. There's no warning. There's no error. There's just behavior that someone has to notice before you go in and spend possibly a long time tracking it down because you might be you know, off the scent because it manifests itself somewhere far away from where the problem is. So uh, let's try that here in Elm. I'll give it a one. Okay, so um, can everyone see that? Yeah, so it won't compile again. I'll move that over. It's like the third argument to function pluralize is causing a mismatch. Um, function pluralize is expecting the third argument to be a number, but it's a string. Uh, yeah, and then it gives you a bunch of hints. It's pretty friendly. Um, I'll talk about that later. So again, I, I cannot, I can't, make this go to production. It won't even compile and make me the JavaScript file to put on the web server. It's impossible. Uh, the compiler won't let that happen. And also notice I haven't put any type declarations anywhere. What the Elm program is inferring the type of the arguments to this variable. Not all of them, but the last one it is inferring. So it knows that quantity should be a number. And the reason it knows that is because I'm comparing quantity to another number. And if I fire up an Elm REPL, and I say 1 equals 1, true. But I say 1 equals 1. It's like you can't 1 equals string 1. Same thing. It's a type mismatch. So if you're a horrible programmer, and, and the line below that you said, if quantity equals quote one, you know, under the else. Oh, down here? Yeah. So now now I'll say, let, let's do that. So I'll say if uh, quantity equals uh, quote one, yeah. then I want, let's say, singular. Yeah. You're still using that. Then, yeah. then, thank you. And then I'm going to say else, else plural. plural. And then I'm going to give it string one. Yeah. So what yes. what 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 do we expect to happen here? It fail. It's another it's another error. What what's that? Yeah, it's it's saying, come on, man. <laughs> Over here you're telling me it's a number, right. and here you're telling me it's a string yeah. that is not consistent. It's looking so you for can't, can't the problem, yeah, you can't do it. It's it's looking for the consistency of your entire program and all of the files you import and all of the files they import. Literally, the entire program is yeah. being checked for consistency or you don't get anything to deploy to production. So that code is, is like it will never, yeah. Elm won't even entertain the idea. So, so Elm is compiling, not transforming. Correct. And what's the difference? The difference is that if we do something wrong in a transpiled language, like say Singlua, and also give it the wrong type, it still takes that as input and produces output that you can take and deploy to production. So now I have my really nice cross-platform Babelified scripts, which I'm going to minify, and I'm going to put it on the server, so and it's got bugs in it. It doesn't check the integrity of the code. Yeah, it's literally like a text. It's a pattern matcher. It's a pattern matcher. It, it's not looking at the meaning of the code. It's saying when I see these symbols, I turn them into those symbols, and then here's a file. Oh, okay. 
compiling is actually doing some reasoning or some calculations. Yeah. And so if the calculations are consistent. <coughs> well, the old days, you would compile into a C program or DLL, right? And that, that's like the machine code. So yeah, so it's the same exact process. If you write C code, C code is the equivalent of your your Elm code, yeah. and but the output in Elm code is JavaScript. The output in C code is some bytecode. Yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> exactly. So um, what I'm going to do? Oh, we've got some questions on the go-to meeting. Ah. <laughs> Babel. <laughs> Thanks, Isaiah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So, um, all right. Uh, let's let's have another look. Might as well just leave it like this. Oh no, because I want my notes. Um, nah, I'll leave it like this. That means I can do that. So we'll just have a quick look at Elm. This is just a whirlwind tour. I've got to start moving because there's so many slides. <laughs> so you've got values in Elm. These are strings. Um, hello on the Elm REPL is going to say, here's the value, hello. It has a type string. You can concatenate them with the double plus. Uh, numbers of values, they're ints or floats. Um, you've got the same kind of uh, math you would see in most other languages. You do get integer division, which is kind of interesting. Oh, that was nice, Isaiah. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. <laughs> um, so yeah, you've got numbers and strings. Um, you've seen some if expressions. You'll notice that the trues and the falses are uppercase. Probably some of you are like, that's ugly. But you'll see exactly why, and you'll probably think it's awesome later. Um, maybe you won't. Whatever. Um, so everything in Elm is immutable. I cannot create a reference to a value and then say that reference now has a different value. It won't compile. I can write the code. And when I try to compile it, it will fail. Elm is um, immutable. Um, so there's no triple equals. If you say x equals 1, and then later on you can say x equals 2, yeah. it shows over. Yeah, it won't even compile. It's not like I've got to wait for the code to reach that bit while it's running, and then it blows up. I'll never even be able to make the code with that in it. So, so to create new pointers, do you do that? Sorry? When you're doing that, you just have to so if I say x equals 2, and then I wanted x to be 2 plus 1, I would say y equals x plus 1. So now I've got every time I have to create a new thing. How do you do a loop? There's no such thing as a loop in L. You cannot loop. It's not even in the language. It's a bold language. I know. It's awesome. And I, I can't believe I left that out. But um, the reason you don't do loops is because you use recursion. You call yourself again. And you give yourself different arguments each time. And each time you give yourself the same argument but minus a number until it gets to zero, and then your loop stops. That's how it works. Um, so now we have uh, it's strongly typed, of course. Everything has a type, and it checks it at compile time. We know what compilation is versus transpilation. Um, you have lists in Elm that kind of look like arrays in JavaScript, except lists can only have values of a single type. And then you've got functions from this list module which you can you know, use where they're attached to the word list, or you can use them just with is empty, depending on how you import them. You've probably seen some of the import syntax with JavaScript. Um, so yeah, list.isEmptyNames is names is false. List.length names is three. You can reverse the names and get a new list. You can create a function, double, and we've seen a function. Double n is n times two. Then I can pass my double function to map. It'll map that function over every value of the item in the list and give you a new list with all the values doubled. Not a lot of that stuff's already in JavaScript. Uh, you've got records, which might be the equivalent of a JavaScript object, except they're immutable. Um, they can have multiple different types. So instead of x colon 3, y colon 4, it's x equals 3, x equals 4. Um, and you access the properties of a record with a dot. Happens to be that the properties are also functions, so you can say dot name bill, and you'll get gates. And that's really cool, because you can map name as a function, and you can use it when you're mapping. So I can take three bills and map the name function over them, and I get the gates, gates, gates. So uh, another data type, which is not in JavaScript, though, but is in Elm, is a fixed length tuple. So if I want, may, uh, this is used when things go together, naturally. So um, if I want a last sync time and the um, sync 
uh, let me think. So let's say I want um, a session ID and the session creation time, and they should always go together as a single unit logically in my code. I might use the tuple data structure to, to pull them together. And there's ways of pulling those values out. Don't worry about understanding tuples too much. Just remember that you heard it, and when you're looking around later, you can dig in. It's a cheap class. Uh, it's data. It's just a data structure. Yeah. So um, in a tuple, every value can have any type, and the type of the tuple itself is the sum of the types of its values. So this here is that tuple's type. So if you, if you define a function that takes these tuples and you give it one that's got another value, it's like that's not the same kind of tuple as the tuple that I take, and it'll not compile. All right, you can forget about tuples now. Um, so we saw functions, you know, the name, space, each argument equals, and then an expression, a single expression which yields a single value. Um, this one I'm not going to go into too much right now. Well, actually, I'll have to. So what happens in JavaScript if you've got an add function and it takes an A and a B, but you only pass it a B, uh, sorry, you only pass it an A, it'll give you A plus undefined, right? whatever the answer to that is in JavaScript. Over here in, in Elm, if I pass my divide function here, just the x, and I don't give it the y, it doesn't say, all right, well, I'm just going to use undefined for y. It gives me a new function that accepts the y and is already kind of seeded with the x. So this is how you define the, the type signature for functions. So divide is a function that takes a float. If I only give it a float, then it gives me a function that takes a float. And if I only give it one more float, then it gives me a float. Or divide is a function which, I, if I give it a float and a float, it returns a float. I don't know if that's clear. I give it one float. What I have now is a function that takes a float and returns a float. If I give it two floats, it just gives me the answer. We'll come back to that. Um, so here's an example. I've got my divide function, and I'm going to only give it the number 12. The return value. I've assigned to the name divide12. The type of divide12 is the function that takes the other float that I didn't give divide and will do the and apply that value to the division of 12, finally returning the answer. So if I pass 3 to divide 12, I finally get 4. You can look more at that later. Um, you can do the same kind of thing in a kind of really ugly way in JavaScript by having a function that returns a function, but it's like almost something you would never do. There's libraries out there to make it nicer. You can use things like Ramda and other libraries to auto-curry your functions. But again, it's now noise that's in amongst the, the signal, which is actually just the business logic you're trying to write. So um, the nice thing about functions that are auto-curried is if you only give them everything but the last argument, it returns a function. And you can start chaining them together. So what happens here, I'm taking the string four comments, repeat is a function that takes two values, a number two, and then a string. And what it would do is just return four comments, four comments. But I'm not giving it the second argument. I'm just giving it two. So the return value is a function that takes just the string, but it's seeded with two, it's like configured. So four comments automatically gets passed in as the second value here. Its return value automatically gets passed in as the value for reverse, which is takes one argument by giving it zero. So reverse now is just the reference of the function. So each of the lines is passing its result as an argument to the line below. So this is like saying pass four columns, so it's saying string will repeat two four columns, which returns two four columns, and then string will reverse two four columns, they're backwards, map out backwards double four columns to this map function, which replaces the O's with X's, now I've got a backwards double for, for comment with x for o. Then I uppercase the whole thing, and I've got this. Now that's just a bunch of string functions. That's not something fancy. I mean, it is sort of fancy, but it's not something you do just because it's fun. There's really like legitimate ways that you can totally simplify a chunk of code by remembering that you can structure it this way. And it's pretty clear to like just look down the list and see what it does. Relative to, like I could write this same code as one big thing on one line with nested parens. And it'd be much harder to read. So that's a bit early in my process. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, we're going to go to the pluralizer, and here's one I kind of made earlier. So, um, everyone can see Atom. So I've got my pluralized function. Everyone's familiar with that, right? And we saw earlier how we've got some a main function, right? Actually, let me go back to the uh, trial real quick. So I can I can import more than just text here. I can import div h1 p uh, ul li, and I can say I'm going to have div which is a function in Elm from the HTML package which I've imported, a function that takes two arguments, an array of attributes like in HTML, and then an array of children. So this is kind of like React. So my children for the div, and the way you would structure this is maybe something like this. So my first child is going to be a P, which is going to get given no arguments. Maybe here I'm going to say, Uh, and then I can say, so that's how I would put a class on it. And all the attributes that exist are available. Um, P is going to have none, but it is going to have children, though. Whoops. And then inside my, let's make that a UL. And then I'm going to have an LI with no attributes. This is not auto-formatting my code, so it's going to be messy. And there is a tool that does that. And then I'm going to have one child of li, which is like text. So with any luck, that will actually work. And now I've got a div with a ul and an li, and then a text, a text node. And above that, I can have above the ul, I'll have an h1, which takes no attributes. Oh, no, I'll give it one class header. And it'll have some child, children, and that'll be text uh, pluralizer. That should work. Cool. Yeah, so this is very much like um, the functions in React, which people are encouraged to use as JSX. But it's just a very simple pattern. Element, zero or more attributes, zero or more children, and then nest it. Does it do the same I don't know if it's the same. I mean, it definitely yeah, has its own event it system. Does its yeah, it has all of its own stuff. Yeah. yeah, so I can import down here, import uh, HTML.events, exposing on click, and I can, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll turn to the other program now. So, um, if you, in the H1 function, if you swap class and the text, um, if I put these the other way around, yeah. So what's going to what's going to happen? Yeah, let's I mean let's try it. So now I'm trying to do that, right? So there's a type mismatch because text returns a string, class is returning a node. The argument to h1 is a list of nodes and a list of strings, but I'm giving it a list of string and then a list of nodes. So the arguments are of the wrong type. Lists can only have one type. Uh, cool. So um, uh, kill the REPL, CD, pluralizer. So um, Elm Reactor. This is one of the tools that comes on the command line for Elm. Uh, so I've got a, a pluralizer here, goose and geese. That's working. And if I keep going down, it goes wrong because I've got minus one, and that's not equal to one. So it's a really crappy program, but I'm not trying to make the best goose geese program. <laughs> I'm just trying to show you how this fits together early on. But let's follow it through. So earlier on, my main function in the um, in this code was returning just a piece of text. Then we just refactored it a bit, and now it's returning uh, a virtual DOM dot node, right? Um, and the main function knows how to deal with that. Over here, though, we were using this beginner program, which comes from the HTML dot app package. Beginner program is a way of creating a program that might have some interactivity. So I, I will, the argument to a beginner program is a record, which expects a, um, three types, uh, a model of any type. And you can say any type in Elm, by the way. 
um, a, a view um, and an update. So I'm seeding the, the model with just the number one, a seeding the view with this view function. So view is a function. View, everyone should know, like is the equivalent of a React render function. You give it a model and it gives you a virtual DOM, a description of the DOM, and then your virtual DOM, the effect manager, takes that description, the virtual one, and it decides how to manipulate the real one. Okay, then you give it the update function, um, which takes a message and then a model, and then we'll give you a new model. So it's a way for you to ask for that model to be changed and then pass down the tree, like we talked about earlier. So update is like the dispatching an action in, in, a, in a Redux application or I don't know what the equivalent might be in, Re in uh, Angular. So what's here is uh, I'm, I'm importing that event that I did earlier, and I've got this on click, and I'm saying, all right, one of the attributes of my button is gonna be on click, and I'm going to pass decrement or increment to the on click event handler. And then what's gonna happen is the Elm runtime is gonna say this event occurred. Um, I'm going to do something. I'm going to call the update function. I'm going to pass it the message. This is one of the messages. This is the other one. And the, the model, which is up here, initialized as, um, as one. And I'm going to run your logic. So if my message was increment, which is happening on the, uh, sorry, decrement, which is happening on the minus button here, then I return the model uh, minus one. But if my message is increment, then I return the model plus one. That's our new version of the single centralized state. Now the model is either greater by one or le lesser by one. It goes through and it re-renders the view, but with the new version of the model that was returned by the update function. Is that all clear as mud? Wow, I'm totally, yeah. Um, so uh, <clears throat> what, what we've got here though is if I create another button, and I'm just going to do an ugly one. I'm going to say um, double, and I, my message will be double, and I save that. Um, where have I got it running? Here, and I refresh. There's another button, but it's not doing anything yet. Actually, you can't even see the model. I'm going to add. I'm going to add the model underneath here to the. So I'm passing, concatenating the model to, uh, that's not right. So I'm converting the number to a string and then I'm concatenating with this string and then I'm passing that to the text function. So model is one, two, three, two, one. The double's not doing anything. So I've, I've got a bug in my code right now actually. You know, I've got this dot, dot, double being passed in, but no one's handling it. So I, what I need to do is say, else if message triple equals double, then model times model, right? Refresh it. My bad. Model plus, uh, times two. My bad. All right. So yeah, three, four. 8, 16. So that's how that's working. But what if I've got like Dubal? Nothing. Because Dubal comes in and it's like, da, 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 not Dubal, not Dubal. I mean, not double, not double, not double. I'll just return the model. So um, this category of bug we can eliminate using some of the tools that are available to us in Elm. So I'm going to create a type. Uh, type message equals, um, and it's going to be increment. Actually, I'll structure this like, oh, I don't have to care actually, because I'm using, it's going to be um, decrement, or it's, whoops, or it's going to be a double. Then, instead of using strings for this stuff, I'll use decrement. And this is a union type or a algebraic data type. Don't want that.
And there's something powerful. So I'm going to take double out like we did earlier, where I had it and it was doing nothing. I'm going to save that. Um, and actually, I'm going to switch to, I forgot to do this. I'm going to say case um, message of. Then I'm going to say increment model plus one. Decrement model minus one. And I'm going to leave it like that. We'll leave off the double like we did earlier. But I can't, though. Uh, by the way, I have a command line linter tied up to Atom. It's really, really simple. And it just does the same thing as if I was trying to compile it on the command line. Model is um, model. Whoops. Thanks. So it's saying, hey, this case does not have branches for all the possibilities. I've created this data structure. And if I use a case statement for it, not case statement, case expression, then it says the compiler enforces that you must check for every single case that's there. So I cannot, again, ship this code to production until I fix that. So I have to say double and then model times two. Now it's working, but I, I'm much less likely to A, have a typo, because if I try Double, it's like Double's not in the type message. Uh, so that won't work. And I can't omit one of the cases because it said you didn't cater for all the cases. So again, we're seeing here uh, a tool available to you provided by this language, which isn't available in JavaScript. But there are other languages that have this concept of these union types. That if you use that tool, it's kind of like an enum, exactly. Except for there's no mechanism to guarantee that you've checked every case in an enum in Java. And there is an L. Um, so um, I've added some interactivity. I need to go back to the presentation. Uh, there. Cool. So um, that was a type. The, uh, the message with its increment, decrement, double is a type. And um, because of uh, one of the major benefits of Elm is that um, runtime errors are not usually, in fact, I don't think there's been, I can't point to where someone's had a runtime error and like talk, talk to people about it, apart from where there was a bug in the compiler itself. Um, and because of, yeah, there's of course logic errors. If, I'm, if I've got a, a function and my greater than should be a less than, there's no way you can know whether that, the, no compiler can tell if that's correct. Um, but because of type inference, the compiler figures out what flows in and out of all your functions, even if you don't add the type uh, declarations. But there's a lot of really valid reasons to add the type declarations uh, for people that are reading your code more, more than anything else. So as you know, you get these errors if you, if you give Elm the wrong types. No matter how big and complex things get, it checks that everything fits together based on just your source code. And you can actively use this type system for, to improve the correctness and maintainability of your code. So I'm going to put some type annotations. Oh, no, I think we did that. So um, some of these practices in Elm, there's no other way of doing it. In fact, one of Elm's kind of guiding principles is let's only give developers a single way of doing something. It's got centralized state. Everything's already immutable. You don't have to choose to use immutable, or, or if you do, choose to use it the right way. Um, it's got uh, the compiler that's already giving you type checking everywhere. So it's no, like, did I get the prop type set up right? We'll list those things. In fact, here they are. There's a bunch of, oh, maybe kill this slide. I don't know. You're seeing it anyway. <laughs> it's too busy. So you're seeing, like, because these ideas are good, um, you're seeing convergence on them. And actually, I suspect a lot of you probably heard of Redux. Maybe you haven't seen it or done anything with it. But Redux is a directly, it's a, basically a copy of some of the aspect of Elm for managing centralized state. Um, but implemented with JavaScript. Who's behind Elm? A guy called uh, Evan Chaplicki, who is a Harvard grad that works for a company called No Red Ink in San Francisco, and he's paid by them to work on the compiler full time. Super awesome guy, humble, soft spoken, all the rest of it. Um, so, how would Elm um, handle accessing the database? That is exactly what this next section is about. <laughs> so why is Elm different? Elm is composed 100% of pure functions. 
which immediately begs the, fiction, uh, the question, what is a pure function? Uh, yeah, that's fine. So in this code, I'm saying that there's a side effect here. Can anyone spot what it is? Or, or can they not? If you can, just speak up, because we're running out of time. <laughs> All right, so to-do list.to-do's to -do, to -do list is being changed. Um, that's true. But also, I'm not even returning anything from this function. Right? Literally, I'm not returning it. So a function that returns nothing can only be called for some side effect that it has, because you already have nothing. right? So um, that's what's happening there. The side effect, as Matt pointed out, is that this to-do list, which is external to the function, has a to-do's property. And this function, without taking to-do list as an argument and without returning anything, is mutating the environment around it. So if I wanted to test this function, I've got to make sure there's like a to-do list dot to-do's in its environment, then run it, right? Which is kind of painful. So uh, it, the effect in this case is like mutating some object that's outside of the scope of the function. So what about this case? We actually are returning something this time. We've got a count. We're, this, is a, this is an example from Angular's uh, like tutorial or whatever. Um, we've got a side cause going on in this one. So Matt, come on, you know what it is. Yeah, well, I am mutating. I'm mutating count, but count was only created inside the scope of the function. So that doesn't necessarily like impurify. But what, what is happening though? The internal function of four inches. For each is the internal function of four inches, but I'm talking about the remaining function. So the, the answer uh, in this case is that we're not passing any arguments to the function. Right. So kind of it's it's similar. We are returning something, but we didn't pass any arguments in. So again, this function relies on the existence of something outside it for its being called to make any sense. If I call this function and I don't give it any arguments, it's only going to make sense if the function is in an environment where these things exist and it does things to them. So those are those are not pure functions. Um, so there's no arguments here. So a function that has no arguments, either it returns the same value every single time, or there's a hidden argument which exists in its environment that changes the behavior of the code every time you call it. And every language supports pure functions. Everyone can write this function in like every programming language. So what makes a language functional then? If, if uh, you know, if we if we use that as a criteria, the word would be meaningless. So this guy Chris Jenkins, who I linked to, says functional programming is about eliminating side effects where you can, but controlling them where you can't. And that will lead you on a very interesting journey. And you'll probably look and see functions like that in your code base. Uh, and it's Chris Jenkins' deep hope that in the morning you'll go to your computer and you'll see side effects everywhere and that it will ruin your lives and torture you <laughs> for years. But it will also make you a better programmer. So um, we'll see how this sound works out. This is Simon Peyton Jones. Uh, so here we've got languages, and we've got uh, ones that are uh, uh, useful, useful, and here's ones that are useless, and here's ones that are uh, uh, unsafe, and here's ones that are safe. Okay, by, by, by which I mean safe, I mean very limited effects. Effects, I mean, uh, I mean side effects, side effects, limited, uh, controlled effects. This is any effect anywhere. And this is this up here is C, right? Okay. Um, and down here is Haskell. And actually also here is C sharp and Java and C, pretty much every mainstream language is in this useful but unsafe camp. Now let's talk about that for a second. Even C sharp. Oh sure. Uh -huh. C sharp. The, uh, the what does C sharp program do? It's an imperative program. It's a sequence of steps. Every line to do this, then do this, do this. When you call a method, often it has no argument, so no result. It may have some arguments, but no result. And why? Because it's um, because its sole reason for calling it is to have an effect on the world to change the state of something. It's just it's fundamentally effectful. Okay. Uh, so this is a very powerful computer code. Yeah. That's what our machines do lots more. It's incredibly useful. In fact, it's absolutely. So what we're what we'd like to. What we'd like to get is here. This is Nirvana. 
Now, I don't think Elm is Nirvana. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but like, we all would rather things were safe and useful. Uh, I presume. How did that work? Was it inspired by Ruby um, in some ways? Because Elm seems to have. It's totally different to Ruby. Yeah. Ruby is non-functional. Right. It's I can't. Oh yeah, well everyone's trying to design a language for better. improving things, right. but this language is fundamentally different to Ruby. So I wouldn't say that it has any similarity really to Ruby. Uh, so that was Simon Payton Jones. Yeah, it's cool. I've got. I can give you links to all this stuff. Um, how do I get out of this? Oh, I go. I go back. I go back. <laughs> So anyway, there's the link, it's in the thing, uh, I'll share it. So this is what he said, we've got Nirvana up there, and um, I reckon probably Elm's somewhere in that green triangle, but I'm not gonna argue about it, and that's not what I'm here to try to convince you of. You can look into that and find out more about Simon Payton Jones. So I mentioned earlier that every single Elm program is 100% composed of pure functions. It has no side effects. So how do we do anything useful, which is exactly your question. Um, so we all remember the example of the virtual DOM, right? The render functions take data, in this case it's a this that has props, which is a bit icky, but it's cool. And the result of the render function is a description of the DOM that gets passed uh, as data to the virtual DOM, and the virtual DOM does the job of producing the side effect. So render is not in that case, but you can envisage a pure render function that takes data in, returns that DOM description, Render function's still pure, but in order for it to remain pure, it needs someone to do the dirty work, and that's the virtual DOM. The virtual DOM is an effect manager, and it manages one kind of effect that is in the world, which is the DOM. But there's all kinds of other effects that are out in the world that we can do, like databases. Elm is an effect manager for everything. This is how an Elm program is 100% pure, pure functions. Um, time. Randomness, DOM, Elm's got effect managers for all of these things. Elm is the effect manager for all of these things. Web sockets, storage, you get the idea. So pure functions that you write in Elm describe these effects as data. So you're using Redux, who's using Redux? Um, so how are you handling asynchronous, asynchronous functionality in your Redux? Are you using something like Redux Saga? Or Redux Logic. So you've got probably done something that we've done in the past, where you've got um, an action creator that receives the dispatched message, and then maybe it has to make a network request, and there's a series of chained promises, and then it might dispatch things during that, and it doesn't actually return anything useful. It's just supposed to, you know, call dispatch. Yep. Right. Now you can take that function though. And instead of doing that asynchronous work, you could return a description of that work, which is what Redux Saga is about. And then the effect manager, which is the Redux Saga middleware, receives that description. And it does the work. And then it either throws an error or it yields through its generator the value that's the result of work being done. So that's the idea with Redux Saga. But in Elm, all your functions are pure because it has this effect manager that can, it can describe the work and the effect manager does the work. Mutate the DOM, fetch a database record, send the network request, even generate a random number. So you produce a command, which is kind of like the action, and Elm returns a message, which comes back to your, your code, and you use that message, which has a payload, to update your state. So commands can come from a range of different places. They can come from events, from the user clicking things, because I've told this button when someone clicks it, tell the Elm runtime that this is the command that should happen. Uh, it can come from your code, just telling the Elm runtime to do things. Or you can subscribe to things like time. You know, every second, tick, send a command to, to Elm. Uh, uh, Web sockets, things like that. So you will never ever see code like this in Elm. You'll never be able to say time in milliseconds is date.now. Because date.now is not a pure function. I call date.now again, it's giving me a different value. It's a hidden argument, right? So what, what would happen in Elm is I would say, send a command to the Elm runtime that I'd like to know the time, please. 
and the Elm runtime will send you a value back, and I send that command as data, another part of your program receives the value of the time at which it received that command, and you just roll. So you've got pure functions, but you're getting time. Same goes with randomness. Give me a random number, yep, as a description of the work. Elm does the dirty work, whatever mechanism it has, and then it returns you the result to the part of your program that then uses it, carries on, just pure functions. So you ask for things with a command, Elm does your bidding. It's not just a virtual DOM manager, it's other things manager. Go ahead. So, so what if I make a query for a certain you know, data in the database and it's not there? So, or we're gonna, maybe I spell the, uh, yeah. you know, something wrong, how does Elm does yep. it give me an error or what? It does give you an error, but it gives it to you as data. And that's exactly what we're about to talk about. Um, one of the things here that people might be balking at is, hey, if I can't even say date.now and I've got to use this framework infrastructure for doing that, that sucks. I would rather just be able to say date.now and move on. So the trade-off at its simplest form with something like Elm that you're making is you either move simple things like time and random to a controlled environment, or you move complex things like your entire code base to an uncontrolled environment. So I'll let you guys be the judge of that. So this is the major difference between Elm and its competitors like PureScript, which is not pure, or ClojureScript, is all of the side effects are controlled in Elm and all of your functions are 100% pure functions. Very easy to test, no mocking, very easy to reason about. Um, you can trade, you can throw all of that away and all of the benefits it brings, but now you can have like one line JS interrupt, or I can say time.now and then have two lines of code to print it. If that's the thing that's valuable to you, that's cool. Um, so it's good. And this is an enormous benefit for maintainability, and it's really awesome to read about some of the stories for people that have built big things in production and then compare it about their previous experience. And this is a tool that's available to go and use now, um, and you know you probably want to check it out. So would you say you write fewer tests for Elm? Absolutely, because there's categories of tests that you write that don't that don't have a meaning in Elm. Like, I want to write a test to make sure this thing has a certain type. The program would never come up. You still definitely need to and want to write tests in Elm because like Matt was saying, business logic cannot be inferred by a compiler. So, um, but you write fewer tests. Um, it's right. also implies that if you're writing Now, that is like the version two of this talk. Right. So what you, the way you do that is you implement an effect manager, right. and then like the Elm interface to that effect right. manager that bridges it. No, it's not. It's in, it's in JavaScript at the moment, or for future things it would be, yeah. So you know where it's going. So uh, there's lots of other hazards for our programs, though, like the kind of one that you were just talking about with the database. Uh, we'll get to that kind of thing. But here's a huge one, right? Uh, null and undefined exceptions, invariants, and I'll define invariants later, not too much later, I promise. Um, as you probably guessed, just in the same way that side effects are kind of lifted into the type system as a type, the type of command, um, nulls and exceptions and invariants can all be lifted up into the type system, which means these things are checked at compile time. So um, you use these new kind of data structure that doesn't exist in a language like JavaScript, um, and the, un the decrement, increment, double was an example of this. Elm is a type of ML. It's the category of languages. If you do uh, Wikipedia ML, you'll see like F Sharp, OCaml, Haskell, Elm, PureScript. They're all kind of types of ML. Um, and they all have these algebraic data types, which are really uh, powerful tool for correctness. So similar to an anum, exactly like you said earlier. So we saw bool, right, with a capital T and a capital F. Well, the reason is this is the literal implementation of Boolean in L. That is how Boolean is implemented in L. And if I want to create a new bool, then I use one of the available constructors. And it's not a constructor like a class in the OO sense. They're values. And uh, if you use the case statement on them, then the compiler will enforce that you've checked for each of the types of scenarios. And you can create your own uh, types like this for modeling data. You might have a game phase type, ready, in progress, one lost. 
And if you use a case statement for that, the compiler will make sure that any game phases you added, everywhere in your code where you're, you're iterating through them, it warns you. Like, you, you didn't add this new type. So the moment I add a new type to that list, everywhere that uses that list in my code is broken. And I go home on Friday, great, knowing my, my code's working. Well, not quite, but I still feel cool because on Monday I've got a lovely checklist to go through and I don't have to like, worry about remembering where all of those things were. The compiler is like my buddy that's saying, this is what you need to do. Excuse me, when you're talking variants, uh, what system are you running? What? Variants? Oh no, it's in invariants, not variants. Uh, you were just talking about that right up there. The bottom word there? What's that? Are you talking about? Are you talking about this? Yes, I'm talking about variants. I'm still learning. Oh, well, I'll define that. Just a, just a few slides from now, what an invariant is. And it's a kind of bug you can think of in your code. These three things cause problems in people's code all the time. Um, so null and undefined. <laughs> I don't know, I kind of like this. I stole it from someone. I, I linked to them, so it's cool. <laughs> undefined is not a function. It is known. Um, Martin Trozier. So here's, here's an interesting uh, question. List.head, Alice Bob Eve. Who knows what that's going to return? And it's not Alice. Uh, what about the, the second one? What's list.head with an empty thing? And is that going to return null? Undefined? So we can actually try this. OK, so oh, I need both of those. Uh, I have another one. So I'm going to start an Elm REPL, Elm REPL, uh, import, import list, and I'll say names equals Alice, um, Bob, different names. Yeah, so double Strings are double quotes, characters are single quotes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so if you really love single quotes, then you can ignore everything else. Anyway, so there's my names. It's a list of strings, list.head names. Now, you said it's going to be Alice, but it's just Alice, which is a kind of maybe. So now I've got list.head empty thing. Well, that's clearly nothing. That is, I mean, I thought that was obvious. I don't know. I'm just kidding. So anyway, the point is you're not getting just, you know, where you are. <laughs> I've written myself as a corner there. Uh, you're not getting Alice, you're getting just Alice. And you're not getting undefined or null, you're getting nothing. So, we've got this union type called maybe. Uh, I can create a new maybe in one of two ways. And it's not new because it's not instantiation or anything like that. I can create a maybe value saying just and then the name Alice or nothing, but they're both maybes. So if I write a function that says maybe had the accept a type of maybe string, I can pass nothing into that function, it will compile. I can pass maybe Alice into that function, it will compile. And guess what? If I'm if I'm testing for when something when a function returns maybe, and I don't cater for the just scenario and the nothing scenario, the compiler will complain and say you didn't cater for the nothing scenario. Just like it'll complain about the lack of me catering for the double scenario with my increment, decrement, and double. It you, have to, you have to cast Alice to maybe null and you pass it in memory. You can easily get Alice out of maybe. And, and, no, and because you, when you're passing it in, you have to say maybe Alice. Yeah, the type. Say Alice. Well, so either you un pull Alice out of the maybe or someone pulls Alice out of the maybe and gives you Alice. Someone has to pull it out of the maybe, but that's trivial. Um, so the, the compiler forces you to handle each case. So case first of that should yeah, case first. So first is like the result of list.head. So here first is a maybe. And I'm saying, well, my maybe can either be a nothing or a just. So the compiler will force me to cater for both nothing and justs. If it's nothing, then I can say the, you know, the list was empty. But if it's just the value, then like the value here is Alice. And also I can say, well, maybe with default none. And then it pulls my maybe. And if it returns nothing, then I get the value none. And there's nice little conveniences for working with maybes. The benefit of working with maybes is null and undefined do not exist in your program. 
if a function can possibly return something that might be null, then your function is returning a maybe. And that means you must, the compiler won't even write, make code for you unless you cater for the null, for the just and the nothing of the maybe. So you've literally, um, you can use maybe in your models as well for modeling. Like person name might have a, a first which is a string, a middle which is maybe a string, or it's a nothing, or I can have a last which is a string. So what we've just done is gone back in time and we've eliminated this entire category of future bugs and it's wiped from existence. So that's null dealt with. Um, uncaught exception, I know we've all seen that in JavaScript and it's terrible. Um, and it's really hard to like get it, get it right. I was amazed, I couldn't believe it, I was disappointed. I think that they're not tagging it right. It should be that with an extra few zeros on the end. Sure. So exceptions, just like nulls, they're lifted into the type system and you've got error, uh, results. You can make a result with an okay or an error. So something like your database call uh, that you said earlier, if I've got a function that like uh, somewhere in there, we don't even have to go to the complexity of a database call, but um, the point is something that might fail returns a result. It doesn't maybe throw an exception as an extra thing that can be returned from the function. And of course, the fact that it's returning result means the compiler will make sure you're handling the okay and the er scenarios for that result return type. The compiler forces you to do it. So um, results are used for things like conversions, storage, HTTP. So an example might be I've got a string that's a number and I want to say string dot two int. Or just like List.head doesn't return Alice. String.toint doesn't return the int 1664. It returns a result, which might be the success scenario for converting it to an int, which is OK value, or the error one, in which case it failed. I could show you that on the command line, but I want to move fast because we're getting late. Um, again, you can have maybe a result that with default, because it's a very common thing. So now you can get rid of those exceptions and the nulls. Anything that's going to throw an exception must return a result, and the compiler will force you to handle the results. It's super like, no way. But after this, maybe you can Google around and see what, see what you find. So what is an invariant is left now. Um, <laughs> what kind of person would model a light bulb like this? Actually, what's wrong with me modeling a light bulb like this? <laughs> is that? Is that a good way to model a light bulb? <laughs> I don't know, I'm being facetious now. So only a maniac is the answer to that question, would model a light bulb like that, because of course you can have on is true and off is true. I can make that data structure happen. And because it's possible, it will eventually inevitably happen at some point. And this is the most simple of scenarios, right? Uh, so this is a silly example of an invariant. But what about this guy? So I've got my uh, connection state, the three of those make sense. I'm either connecting or I'm connected or disconnected. But then I've got like the server address, the last ping time, the last ping ID, session ID, when the session was initiated, when it was disconnected. And they're all maybes because sometimes they apply and sometimes they don't. But because they're all maybes, um, I've got these rules. Uh, so the, I've got these invariants, like I should have only have a last ping time when I have also a last ping ID. To have one without the other, makes no sense. If that happens, there's been a problem. But I can construct that object where both of those have a nothing instead of a just. Same goes with the last ping uh, as a duplication, okay? Anyway, there's rules here about the structure of the program and the compiler is not doing anything to help me get those right right now. Um, if I refactor this using algebraic data types or, or union types, it's actually impossible for me to violate any of those rules on the previous screen there. So if I want to get a connection type using the connecting, I have to pass it a time, the time at which it initiated the attempt to connect, so that it can do things like you know, fail and then retry. If I want to pass it a disconnect, if I want to say the state of the connection is disconnected, I can't do that without saying the time that it was disconnected. The compiler won't let me. And the same goes for the connected state. I can't be connected without there being a session, uh, sorry, sorry, a last ping ID and a last ping time, for like the moment I connected to the ping. So if my state of my connection info is connection state, which is one of these three, those three come with their associated data, 
and I, it's impossible for me to write code that has a connecting connection state without the associated time. So I could have had the time as a maybe and it's nothing, so I'm connected but there's no you know, time that I initiated, but now I can't have that. Maybe that's a bit more of a confusing example. Um, but we'll see, like in our code, ways in which there are invariants all over the place. Are we relying on our logic and everyone agreeing on the rules to not make that happen? Here's a simpler example. I shouldn't have even had the other one. Um, a contact, name, email, and address. But there's new requirements. Email and address are both optional now. But the contact has to have at least one contact method. So we could say, all right, let's give them both maybes, right? And we'll use our, our code to say, you know, give the email a just email address and we'll give the address nothing. And that's valid. But of course we can have two nothings there because they're both maybes. And that's an invalid, that's an invariant. If ever I'm in that condition, there's a bug in my program somewhere. And that bug got past the compiler and it got out to production. So what I... So yeah, so this is the invalid state. I'm supposed to have at least one contact method, but the compiler won't catch this because that's valid when they're both maybes. So here's an option. I can create this contact method type, and it's got email only with the string email address, address only with the string, or email and address, which is type string string, a tuple. And now I have a contact with a name and then a contact method, which must be one of those three things. So it's impossible to have none of those things. Um, so let's test it out. We've got the email only version, El Dudorino, the address only, and then the both. So that now, if I, if I, the compiler will enforce those rules now. But maybe there's another way. I have, uh, on my contact, I have a primary contact, which must be a, a type of contact method. Then I have a secondary contact, which is maybe a contact method. That's another way. It's not quite as good for other reasons that I won't go into. But now I have to have a primary contact that means it has to be one of these things, or it won't compile. But it's okay for this to be not there. This, this is nothing, and it's okay. So I can have just the email, but no, sec no address. I can have just the address, but no email. Or I can have the email and the address, and all three are fine, and the compiler is okay. But I can't have no email and no address, because it won't even compile. A third one we can do is have a contact method there, and then have maybe a list of alternate contact methods. A list can be empty. That's cool. But this one is not a maybe, so it can't, there's no nulls. It has, to be, it has to be a contact method or it won't compile. Now, this is like the tip of the iceberg, and there should be some cracking going on as you start to realize the implications of this yeah, for how you're modeling your code. Yeah, you're using the compiler. Yeah, so beforehand, we had to rely on programmer correctness. Uh, and we could live with this, you know, and we do live with this. And we just communicate the rules to everyone. And we remember to tell the new guy. <laughs> and we maybe write some comments in our code. And if we're lucky, we might even write tests. Or, exactly as you say, we leverage the compiler to enforce our business rules. So um, this is a tool that's sitting there like on your hip. And if you don't use it, you're throwing a lot of like stability and correctness just out the window. So tests are good, but impossible is better. Right, for this stuff. So that's invariance. So we've got this whole host of tools, null and undefined, exceptions, invariance, things that historically have really caused us complexity, especially with side effects coming from everywhere. And then these same kind of characters keep coming back and just causing us headaches and keep banging our head against the wall again and again and again. And we can rule those out with tools like this. It's not the only way of ruling those out. It's a tool that you can use to rule some of those things out and improve things. And this is the section that I kind of run out of time on. Um, it's pretty easy to get up and running with them. You can actually install it as a node module, ironically. Um, it's got a great package manager. Um, Elm's package manager is so great that it enforces semantic versioning. So if I change the name of a function, and I try to deploy that to Elm's like NPM JS equivalent um, with the same version number, just like your code won't compile, it will say, no, I, I cannot do that. And the reason it's able to do that is because it can analyze your code and it can know that that's a breaking change. So you, as the consumer of my library, 
can never get a break from a patch change uh, in my code. You will have when you're when you're upgrading the library, the compile your compiler will now tell you there's a new version, and it won't even make a new version of your program with the upgraded library because it won't compile. So you can't even upgrade the library with the breaking change until you make your code compile to it. So you raise your hand if you had something to break from. Yeah, like just this week. <laughs> so the package manager can really, really save you a problem when you've got this. And this is one of the long-term goals of Elm, is to grow an ecosystem that we can actually rely on, where that kind of thing doesn't happen. Left pad. Just Google left pad and like bug, and you'll find out the amount of mayhem that was caused by someone making a breaking change but not incrementing the, uh, the version the properly. Well, yeah, anyway, I mean, you could, it's, it's you possible. Could. And it happens. What would keep you from depublishing this? Depublishing? I'm going to delete my. That's oh, depublishing? De that's why I left that failed. It wasn't, a, it wasn't oh. a semantic change. He actually like, removed it from the page. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I don't know what the mechanism is for that. De is there a, is the package management system, like, if I wanted my own little private own packages, there's there's some things that we'd like to have I say you know for, for the elm stuff um, that isn't there yet in terms of uh, having your own like linking with npm you probably use npm link don't you so um, you can you can pull an elm package in from like a github repo using tools or you can just um, refer to code that's already on your hard drive somewhere, but you can't publish, like, you can't publish to somewhere. I use the package manager to pull in my, my own code. I don't think so. Now, so you're, you're really, I haven't done too much of that, but you'll probably have to just dig in. Okay, thank you. So this is more about the experience of Elm. It really keeps all the plates spinning in the air. When you leave your desk, the plates are just hanging there. And then you come back, and they're just immediately spinning. It's spinning again because the compiler like, is going to tell you everything that is wrong with what you were doing, which, is, which gets you right back. And that's great not only for coming back on Monday, but for just distractions. If you're in the middle of doing some big change in JavaScript, you want like, to shut the world out because you've got to make sure you remember all the things that you were supposed to remember while you're doing that. Whereas with this, you can like, have headphones on and be in pasta, and your wife's talking to you, and you're watching Game of Thrones. And you're just, you're just going through the checklist that the compiler is giving you, and you're fixing things one at a time. You don't even have to think about the scope and scale of your program. You just think, I want this to look like that. And it's like fix, 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 and it works. That's kind of the experience. So yeah, this guy, Luke Westby, has got ADD, and he did this great talk. Like He's got crippling ADD, and like he loves Elm for the reason that he's so much more productive than he ever has been, with Elm because focusing and staying concentrated is legitimately really, really hard for him. So that's what he chose to make his talk about at some Elm Conf recently, which you can look at. Uh, so it's early days for Elm. Um, this is the timeline for Python. The creator was still the primary contri contributor uh, You know, five years in. We're not quite five years in here, getting, getting there, I suppose. Um, but it's early days, and there's uh, a lot of work to be done. But you can really um, gain in terms of maintainability uh, if you've got the kind of code for which maintainability and correctness and working with a lot of other people is, is important, then it could be a really valuable tool because you can eliminate certain kinds of problems. If you're just kind of doing some jazz coding and you want to just mess about and get something up and running that's not really ever going to be relied on or have to be maintainable over time, it might be a bit annoying because you're not like, you know, you don't care that it's a bit wrong here, there, and everywhere. So it's horses for courses. JS interop, um, it treats JS like a side effect of world. You talk to it in a kind of same way through this subscription command based mechanism, which you're already using for all the other side effects you're doing. So it means you can safely talk to JavaScript. You're not gonna get the nulls, you're not gonna get the exceptions. You're gonna get the data types that you're already being forced to handle by the compiler. This is why so I did have this called, yeah, it was why Elm's different. This is why Elm's different from PureScript and ClojureScript because they have this 
foreign function interface with JavaScript that allows all of those exceptions and the nulls and all the rest of it to just creep right in. ClojureScript is weakly typed, and it does have the concept of null, right, Bill? So that whole category of problems still exists, and you can see lots of people who have written blog posts about you know, their experience um, transitioning from one to the other or back and forth between them. And uh, it's a really interesting read because there's so many cool things about ClojureScript like compared to JavaScript, but it lacks these tools which when you have them, you start to think, why would I ever not live with these? Um, you can start to integrate it with existing projects, make a little, like this widget is in Elm, the rest of it's in React. Or I want to um, have some integration with Redux where this particularly complex and error prone piece of business logic needs to be right. I'll do that in Elm and the rest of it can all be JavaScript. You can do that kind of thing. So here's a few of the people. I'm going to update these later because I ran out of time. Um, this whole presentation is a single markdown file, and I just run one command, and it builds this. Pretty, pretty nice. Um, and then I'll add a bunch of links as well that are relevant. And that's it. So nice it was a long one, and I'm sorry about that. But. <laughs> Our normal time. Any quick questions for Daniel before we uh, break? That's all I know. <laughs> yeah, it's already, I mean, I'll put it on the Slack for the FCIP and also on the Meetup group, and I'll update it with links and stuff. No worries. Hey, Isaiah, if you're still there, we have you on audio in case you have a question or whatever. Oh, I think I just killed the go to meeting by accident by closing my laptop. Nope, mine's open. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah, there. What am I thinking? I didn't, I didn't, I'm not the, uh, yeah, the, the guy. Uh, I'm here. Cool. We have audio on Isaiah, just in case you had a question. Do you ever have the problem of, like, I can't get this to compile? Well, the, the problem is so complex. I'm trying to model this. You know, I, I'm not even sure I've got requirements that are. Thanks, guys. Thank you that are you know, sufficient or accurate, or they're perhaps even contradictory. So I had to talk to two people. They're arguing, but I need to present something so that they can argue about. So I, I'm, I'm, there are probably compiler error messages that could be less confusing. But this, this is actually one of the facets of Elm that I didn't include. So Elm has a repo where people argue all day about how the error messages could be better. And Elm is famous once you start looking into it for having this super friendly compiler that just is nothing like the kind of error messages and jank that you see coming from compilers, especially ClojureScript, because it's got the JVM behind it, uh, or the, the you know the Google Closure compiler. So it's got the most friendly kind of set of compiler error messages in the in the kind of industry, and it's being emulated by other other languages like Rust and F Sharp and Swift are like opening repos and now starting to elevate as a first class citizen the task of making useful error messages. And so in Elm, generally the error messages are so much more precise and clearer than what you're used to seeing. But of course, there's always continuous improvement on that. Uh, Isaiah, I have a couple quick questions. Yeah. Like what, what are uh, compile times like? And what, what are like file size of the final resulting JavaScript? Uh, so if you file? took an Elm file that just said hello and compiled it, it's bringing the Elm stuff with it, right? Just like React. Right. Um, so it's smaller than minified production React. Okay. Which doesn't <laughs> no, but yeah. the point is, it's not a showstopper. Yeah. Right. It yeah, it does the same much. The compile times are reasonable. Yeah. I mean, it's not a problem. The compile times are wicked fast. Uh, in my experience, the product I was working on, I was seeing about one line to 30 lines compiled. Yeah, no, it's so this is like, one I of mean, the massive differences. Console, it's like, don't debug console, you don't have to debug because you've got no errors in the console. You've got business logic errors in the console. You do have business logic errors. So you can't debug those. Uh, yeah, that's that's actually true. Yeah, so you're not going to be able to like step through the code like you would right. um, so with business logic what errors. About, what's the work process what's work the work that's being done on that is the um, Time traveling debugger, uh, which I haven't shown you. And I'm kind of excited that I haven't because when you discover it, you're going to be like, oh, this is cool. It, it, it's 
they broke it intentionally to get some changes done to the core language and they're pushing back the bringing it back um, to like probably 0.19. We're on 0 0.17, 0 0.18 is coming out just after Thanksgiving. Um, that brings a bunch of stuff. So the workflow would be that you've got this um, kind of Chrome plugin type thing, which is showing you your continuous state and all the chain of actions. And that basically is your debug environment. And it's very similar to what you see with the Redux dev tools. You know, you've just got a sequence of these actions happening, except you can replay them because it's all immutable and you have all the guarantees that you have to put effort into providing yourself if you're going to try to do the same thing with JavaScript. So they're also in the own format. Yeah, this is something that I hated for the first five minutes. Then I loved it. So um, I, oh, I'm off of HDMI. I didn't think anyone want to be here this long. That's cool. <laughs> It'll come out, just go for it. it takes a minute to up. Yeah. So um, Elm Formatter, this isn't not anything to do with Atom. I'm using Atom, but this, this tool has nothing to do with Atom. So um, if I want to do, essentially, when I'm writing Elm code, I'm not thinking about how it's formatted. I'm doing shortcuts and just like banging it out, and then I hit, I hit save, and it throws everything in the right place. Now, if you don't like the way it looks, then that's bad for you, um, <laughs> right? It's bad for you. You can't configure it, and lots of people are arguing about it. But no, they're like, no, you know, we want one way to do things because you're not supposed to be thinking about this stuff. You're supposed to be thinking about what you're building. And again, I don't have to think about how the code's formatted. I just write the code, and the formatter does it, and I am very happy to remove that from the list of things that are in my brain. Very happy. I just like self-driving cars. Do it. You know, I don't want to have to do it. The strength of that is until you look at someone else's own code. I mean, it is. It's your code. Yeah, it's yeah that's true, actually. Yeah. yeah, one way of doing things. This is how it is. And actually, the Elm formatter goes much further than that. So they're about to release 0.18 of Elm. And one of the things they're doing is removing this kind of range syntax that you've seen in Ruby. 1 dot dot 5 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They're removing that and replacing it with list.range. They're trying to reduce the surface area of the API, uh, of the syntax, I mean. So when, so let's say I upgrade to Elm 0.18, and my whole code base is Elm 0.17, and I save, it goes through the whole program, and not only does Elm format a format of code, it says, oh, you were on 17, you're now on 18, I'm going to replace all those things with this thing. And now I'm not, it's already kind of upgraded my code to that new stuff to the extent that it can, which is an enormous extent. So all that work is just done. It's pretty nice. There's so much stuff I didn't show you guys, but whatever. This was cool. This was really valuable. I mean, you got into enough detail to justify the value of Elm. That makes a lot of sense. It would have been easy to gloss over that or not cover it well enough. It's really, really good. easy to play with. So um, I'm going to. Um, I'll close these, I'll close these. So I'll just show you how easy you can get up and running. I'll make the uh, banana uh, Elm package install. And it's, oh, no, hang on, CD banana. Elm package install, minus, minus, yes. So it's giving me some downloads, it's putting some stuff in there. Um, Atom uh, main.elm. Okay, module main exposing da, um, import HTML exposing text, main equals text hello FCIP. Save that, it compiles, otherwise this would have complained. Come back here, Elm Reactor, oh, it's already running. Um, got another console open. Um, yes. What was that? It, it, it won't because it's not running because there's already a process running. Uh, what am I graphing for? 
uh, this guy. I want it to die. Ah, it's still doing it. This, this is how easy it is. La. Right. So anyway, what I did was I just package install, create this file, Elm Reactor, click that, and click on the main.elm. So an Elm program, you can actually say, Elm make, and it can produce an HTML file, an HTML, CSS, and JavaScript file. By the way, CSS, JavaScript, and HTML are all part of Elm, and I haven't even gone into the CSS where you have strongly typed compiler-driven CSS. Um, or I can say, make a JavaScript file that I'm going to bundle using Webpack alongside all the other stuff. You can do whatever you like. Hello, FCIP. So now I can, uh, you know, add a couple of these and uh, refresh it. Um, there's tools that go way beyond the ARM reactor. There's the time traveling debugger tools, things like that. But it's super easy to get up and running. If I want to install some new package, it's just the same as NPM. So download NPM install Elm globally, and then do that, and you, your playground is there. And elmlang.org has a pretty sweet um, you know, introduction, and you can just, if you get some time and you want to fiddle, it's going to be pretty painless if you already have Node on your machine. Very cool. Is there a format of the presentation that we could post to the group? I can export one. OK, perfect. And I did record this if, if you're on a photo meeting, so if there's any value in that, let me know. I'll post it on Google Drive or something. I haven't had a chance to go down yet, but I'm pretty sure there's an Elm user group in the Yeah, there's one in Boulder, there's one in Denver. I heard the attendance was a little low in Denver, but Boulder, Wow. Oh, nice. Boulder, Boulder. 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 That's Boulder. But they split into the groups, and it's a great opportunity to like meet you where you were at there. Again, we kind of did a basic tutorial and went through a small app. So. Yeah, this guy, Simon Payton Jones, who drew the chart, is one of the designers of the Haskell language. Um, Elm's compiler is written in Haskell but it has vastly different goals than those of Haskell. Its goals are you don't have to, understand what I want to, to be useful. <laughs> yeah, to be useful and to be friendly and understandable. Exactly. Yeah. How can they contribute if you're, if you're writing um, I think the designers are probably more capable of understanding the syntax of the Elm version of a DOM. Plus, they have a compiler that helps them get it right, which you don't have with HTML. Or they're getting so, you know, Photoshop file and you're figuring out if it's anything. Yeah, you can have strongly typed CSS and HTML with a compiler that fixes problems for you. Um, that's got simpler syntax than our existing weekly type non-compiler syntax. So I just don't think that's even a... I, I think that designers are super smart people that will totally just rock it. Uh, there was... I'm not sure which podcast we were doing these things, but there was someone saying that there was a designer on their team who had to go make a change in some of their own code, and she felt so comfortable in it that she actually started like working on some features something she hadn't done to date because she was like, oh, I get what's going on here. Uh, and so that was sort of the, the yeah. fear factor. Yeah, <laughs> and, and let's, let's say that you've got some, some senior developer who's like, well, I don't want the designer messing with our React code. Well, guess what? They cannot break it because it if they break it and it doesn't compile, so Mr. you know CSS about it. Files, separate, separate file, I mean, there include files or something that you're... That's, oh, modules. So I didn't talk about modules. Okay, no problem. You don't have to get yeah, um, Sorry. it's... Very similar to JavaScript modules, you just import them, okay. and you can. Ex it's just functions grouped into modules that have names. That's it. If you don't expose, like if you've got 20 functions in your module, you explicitly state these are the five that I'm exposing as the surface area API. And would CSS files be just another module here? Uh, they are just functions. Just functions. Okay. There's only. Elm is composed 100% of pure of functions. All right. Um, but, they, but they return some CSS descriptors. 
they were saying like a virtual CSS node or something. It's uh, it's the description of the CSS. Yeah, and there's actually a, a few competing CSS libraries that have various different kind of aesthetic qualities that you can choose from that um, you might have a preference for one or the other. But they're going to kind of, the pressure, the community pressure in Elm is to, can, like, to have one answer that, that most people can use on. Now, don't discourage experimentation or the rest of it, but one of them will get brought into the Elm community package. And if, it, if something better comes along, then there's going to be a breaking change, which won't break your code because of the reasons we talked about earlier. I'm going to ask the last question, which is, have you started using this at data place yet? No, we've just been talking about it. <laughs> no, we're not even experimenting with it. We've got other problems that we have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plugging it into an existing large project is a pretty challenge. Sure. Uh, that that, that interrupt with the outside world is challenging. And it's like, if you were, if you were starting a, pro a project from scratch, it's a great choice. It's, if you've got a pretty significant code base of a lot of things, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to approach it. Yeah, so, so the, the scenario in which something like that would have the greatest success is specifically discussed in the Elm community. And it's the answer is, if you can find something which is problematic or which is broken or which you, you can make that. better, yeah. um, and Elm is the tool that does the better job of doing that, then it's then you've kind of justified bringing it in. Sure. Um, and, and you can have it coexist. Yeah, absolutely. Because it just is part of your webpack process. I mean, just like you're going to have CoffeeScript or Babel or whatever it is you're doing, if this part of it's going to be Elm, then you bring that JavaScript file and, and you use your bundler to bundle it together and just deploy it. And that part won't have a runtime error. Do you even like, just compile it to a JS file and then you know, literally include it in your HTML? Yeah. Stretch and use it as a piece. So in my project, I ended up using a bunch of Angular. Everything, you know, the information going in the database, all done in Angular, everything coming out is Elm. Uh, and as I get better at Elm, I can go and kind of change those modules piece by piece. Well, we should probably wrap this up. So you say Babel, I say Babel. <laughs> that was Thanks awesome. So uh, thank you, everybody. We just go a lot longer than we normally do. So uh, we'll just wrap up. And my fault. This is a great minute or two, but uh, we should probably mosey on so Jessica can depart sometime this evening. <laughs> thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks We're meeting in like two weeks on learning UX with Derek Larson. So that should be. Uh, he's a super experienced UX guy, so he does professionally. It should be fantastic. So uh, maybe we'll see you back here two weeks from tonight. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That was awesome. Good night, Isaiah. <laughs> oh, man. That was really good.